Have you ever wondered if the gift of tongues is for today? Have you ever heard anyone speak in tongues and wondered to yourself, what on earth is that craziness? With 3,000 people getting saved in a single day in Acts 2 because of this gift, and Paul telling us that he wishes everyone had it, I think it's high time we actually truly understand exactly what it is, what it's not, and if and how it's supposed to be used today. So strap in and grab your Bibles, my friends, because we're about to tackle one of the most controversial topics that the human tongue can talk about. Hello everyone, Jim Staley here, Passion for Truth Ministries, and welcome to today's teaching. This teaching is going to be a controversial teaching, no question. It's on the gift of tongues. Probably one of the most controversial subjects in Christendom over the last 2,000 years as people have been debating what's going on with Acts chapter 2. Is it a gift of tongues? Is there a prayer language? How do I speak it? Is it false? Is it of the devil? We're going to find out in this teaching. We're going to go through the top 10 myths as we discover the truth about tongues. Before we do, I would encourage you that if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe right now. And if this, if this ministry and this teaching blesses you, will you consider hitting the like button and doing a comment, making a comment. When you write a comment and you hit like and you subscribe, that increases the algorithm from YouTube's perspective and it they show this video to more people. So it's a ministry tool that we can have that's easy and free to use so we can get this message out there. All right, so let's begin. Before we begin, let's give a definition of the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is simply the supernatural ability to speak in another language that you did not currently know before. Let me read it again. It says, it's the power of speaking in unknown languages and is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 12, verse 10. This gift, by definition, because it's a gift, presupposes that you didn't have it before. So it can't be a learned gift, because if it's a learned gift, then uh, when you get to Acts chapter 12, verse 1, and you get to Acts 14, when it talks about being a spiritual gift, that word in Greek is pneumaticos, and it literally means not of this world or of the air. And so it's where we get the word pneumatic from, air-driven uh, powered tools, a uh, pneumatic drill, for instance, it's driven by air. And so when we're dealing with the spirituals, as the scriptures say, we're dealing with the things that are driven by the Holy Spirit. They're not driven by your mind. They're not driven by the, your natural giftings. And so I think it's really important right off the bat that we know that this is a spiritual gift. It is not a carnal gift. It's not a learned gift. It is only from God, and He gives it to whoever uh, that He desires, as we'll find out a little bit later. A couple other facts surrounding this topic. It was used in Acts chapter 2 in the Feast of Shavuot, better known in Greek as Pentecost today, where people in Jerusalem heard the disciples speaking in various languages, their native tongues. Also, we're instructed to desire all of the spiritual gifts. That's why this is such an important topic, because Paul says that we're supposed to desire all of the spiritual gifts. So we need to know what they are, what they aren't, how we can use them today. Are they available to us today? Are they relevant today? And if they are, how do we get them? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to have... I don't want anything to be left out of what the Holy Spirit has offered uh, for me. Whatever is available to Jim Staley, I want it. I want to grow closer to my King. I want to know Him deeper. I don't want to just walk through life in a natural, carnal, operating by my mind way. I want the whole truth the nothing but the truth, so help me God. And I can tell you and assure you this, my friends, the truth is not just found in the Scriptures alone. God cannot fit in a book or a box. He came before the Word. He will come after the Word. He fills in every gap in the Word. And so at the end of the day, I want both the Devar of God, the Word of God, the written Word, and I want the, the Rhema Word. I want that part of the Word of God that the prophets had, that direct connection of understanding and sensing and feeling the Spirit teaching me uh, what to do in every situation and in all things. A couple other things. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 14, 5a. He said, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesy. And so he's literally saying, I wish every one of you spoke in tongues. And then he says this. He says tongues in 14, 5b is equal to prophecy if it has interpretation. That is how important this gift is, my friends. I know that I've seen it misused. I've seen it abused. I have been embarrassed around people that radically 
uh, abuse this gift. And matter of fact, they don't even have the gift. They think they have the gift. And so I'm hoping to bring some balanced teaching here with this topic. Let the scriptures talk outside of the charismatic movement, outside of Roman Catholicism theology, outside of traditional Protestant theology, and bring this all the way back to the first century. These believers, these Jewish uh, and, and Gentile believers who kept the Torah, who loved Yeshua, and who were given these gifts, what did it look like then before it got radically out of place? And it didn't take very long to do that. And that's what we're going to do. Now, before we go any further, I think it's important that we talk about the risk of getting this wrong. You know, I tried to explain to a friend of mine, teacher, that does not agree with the gift of tongues, that the risk that he's taking, if he in fact is wrong, is he would be standing against not only a gift that the Holy Spirit uh, gave us because of the death of Yeshua, by the way, to edify both ourselves and the body of, of, of Christ and to be a witness to unbelievers, but we would literally be against the language of heaven. My friends, that's how big of a risk this is. That's how important this topic is to get it right. We can't just look at people that abuse it and, and write off and throw the baby out with the bathwater. We got to see what the word says. We got to see what, what the cultural context behind the word is. What did Paul really mean when he said that he wishes that we all had the gift of tongues? And what is the gift of tons, uh, tongues? And what's the Greek and the Hebrew and all of that? We're going to dive into all that. But the risk is so big. Because if, if you believe in the gift of tongues, there's no risk. Because if it's just gibberish and means nothing, then you're simply wasting your time. But I will tell you that the majority of the people, if not almost 100% of the people that I have talked to that have this gift, uh, they will tell you that it brings them peace. It draws them closer to the Lord. Uh, it, it fires them up about, about God. It makes them desire the word more. Uh, they are able to see signs and wonders and healings and miracles far more than it seems like the, the, the average believer does. So they would never not speak in tongues, even if it wasn't real because of the impact that it makes on their life. I'll say that possibility could be because faith is so much greater when you believe than when you don't. But at the end of the day, there's no risk for speaking in tongues, but there is a great risk if you don't believe in it and it's real. So you might be thinking right now to yourself, well, Jim, what if it's not real and it's of the devil? Well, that's one of the myths that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about it significantly. So let's get started on the myths. Before we do, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 says this. It says, or 5, 21 says, test all things, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. And so we're here uh, because we want to test all things. We want to find out what's the truth, what's the whole truth. And this is a scripture that many people that do not believe in the gift of tongues will bring up, is they'll bring up that says, look, we need to test all things. We need to test the spirits. But they don't quote the two verses right before, which says this. 519 says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the prophecies. And so that's the risk. If we get this wrong, we potentially could be quenching the spirit. So ladies and gentlemen, use a your, your mind's eye and picture what quenching looks like. If it's tongues of fire, if the Holy Spirit is a, is, is a pillar of fire going around over the tabernacle of the Holy of Holies in the wilderness, to quench it is to put water on fire, right? Water is what's going to put out fire. So it's that, it's that visual that we're doing if, in fact, tongues is from Yahweh, if it's from God, the Creator, through the Holy Spirit, and we quench this, we are putting water on a revival from God. We're putting water on the will of God. We are literally quenching and slowing down the power of of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just mention this as well, that I believe that this is not only, if you don't already know, can't tell, 
Uh, I absolutely believe in this gift. I speak in this gift. It has absolutely been the most one of the most powerful parts of my prayer life. I'm going to share some personal testimonies, incredible testimonies, uh, near the end of this video. So to wait till the end because some of these testimonies are are going to impact you regardless of which side of the aisle that you're on. But I believe that this gift is so impactful for today. But unfortunately, people have just misused it. They don't understand it. And their denominations are encouraging and promulgating things that simply are out of order and not true. And I believe it's high time that we get back to the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Here's the litmus test of whether something is from God or whether it's not. And you can use this for virtually anything dealing with theology and whether or not it's from the Lord is number one. Is there a life that's being changed and changed and full of repentance from dead works? If you find somebody that is grasping onto something and it's causing them to have a changed life back towards the Creator and, and, and they're, they're repenting from dead works, that's a good sign because Satan is never going to promulgate or imitate anything that is going to cause people to repent. As a matter of fact, I truly believe not only is this gift from the Lord, but I believe one of the hallmarks, proof that it's a gift, is the enemy tries to imitate it. Whenever Satan tries to imitate something, it's because he's trying to hide the real thing. He comes as an angel of light. We'll talk more about that later. Number two on the litmus test. So first one is, if it causes someone to have a changed life and they repent from dead works, that's a good sign. Number two, is there a burden from the lost being developed? If a burden for the lost is being developed and they care and have more empathy towards their fellow man and want them to come into a deeper relationship with God, then that is definitely another hallmark that something is from the Lord. And number three, are people coming underneath the word of God and submitting to its, its authority? When you find people that are submitting to God's authority through his word, they're repenting from their dead works, their lives are being changed, and they are, and they have a burden for the lost, you're dead center on the target, the bullseye of the Holy Spirit working in that particular theology uh, or that particular creed. And so that is a great way to find out if something is really from the Lord. Here's the litmus test. If you don't know any Bible, just look at their life. If their life is turned towards Father and they have a deep walk with Him, then probably need to err on the side of you might be wrong. They might have something that you want. Because every one of us uh, want to have a, a deeper walk with the Lord. And if a particular gift in the scriptures that you don't believe in, but they have a stronger walk with you than the Lord than you, maybe we need to look at it again. And that's exactly what we're doing. If it's deepening the individual's walk with Christ and causing them to increase their image of him, it cannot be from the devil, period. So all of those out there that are telling you that this gift of tongues is from the devil, but the people that are using it have a deeper walk with the Lord and they're repenting, then they're just flat wrong because the devil can never and will never influence someone to walk deeper with Yeshua, with Jesus. All right, let's get to myth number one. It must be of the devil. This is the first myth. How can the devil possess a believer enough to take over the tongue if they are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You see, it cannot be from Satan. If you are a true believer, Satan cannot take over your tongue where you have no control over it and you're just doing whatever uh, Satan is wanting you to say. The Holy Spirit and the devil cannot live in the same place, right? That's what scriptures say. Ironically, the same people believe that the devil can cause someone to speak in tongues believe that God can't. Let me say that again. I've literally met people that are teaching that the devil is causing these people to speak in tongues, but they don't believe that God can do the same thing. I'm going to submit to you that the devil knows exactly what's going on with this gift, and he's trying to hijack it, and he's trying to create a counterfeit to keep people away from it because it is that powerful. If it, in fact, is an angelic language or a language of angels or heaven, then I don't know about you, but if I was Satan, I'd want to keep people away from it. Luke 11, 11 through 13 says that if you ask the father for bread, he will not give you a snake. If you ask him for an egg, he will not give you a scorpion. Now, in case you don't know what those metaphors are, all we got to do is back up one chapter in Luke, and Luke tells us exactly what these metaphors are going to be. In, in chapter 10 and verse 19, it says, 
I have even given you authority to trample on a snake and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. What is Yeshua saying? Jesus is telling us that, look, snakes and scorpions are devils. They're of the enemy. So he says, look, when you come to me and you ask for a piece of bread, I'm not going to give you a snake. I'm not going to give you a scorpion. In other words, if you truly desire the spiritual gifts and you really want the gift of tongues and your sincerity is not for yourself, but just so that you could glorify God and have a deeper relationship with him. And because the scriptures command you uh, to, to, to desire it for the edification of others as well. If you truly, you have, your heart is in the right place and you just want a deeper walk with the Lord. Do you think that the Lord is going to allow the devil to intercept that and take you over? That would be him giving you a scorpion or a snake with your heart's desire is to serve him. What kind of God would do that? Certainly not the God of the Bible. And that's not my opinion. That's Luke's right there. Jesus uh, spoke it in, in Luke chapter 10 and 11. Myth number two, tongues is the evidence of salvation. There's entire denominations that believe that unless you are speaking in tongues, you're not saved. They don't even believe, they believe that you're a second class citizen if you don't speak in tongues. Forgetting that not everybody speaks in tongues. And on top of that, uh, tongues is a gift. Uh, so let's just read here. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Right there, the very Paul that talks about the gift of tongues in, in the same chapter is telling us that by one Spirit we were all baptized into into the spirit. It's not those that are just baptized by a fire of speaking in tongues or have the gift of the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is the gift that God gave to everyone that believes on the name of his son, period. The gift of tongues is another gift that is coming from the Holy Spirit, that's very connected to the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, it allows you to, in some ways to peek into the prophetic realm of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the Holy Spirit, nor is it the evidence that you are saved. It might be the evidence that you've received the gift of tongues is the actual speaking in tongues. But certainly, my friends, salvation comes through one thing. Believing that Jesus, Yeshua, I like to call him in his Hebrew name, uh, Yeshua died, he was the Son of God, died for our sins, and rose from the grave three days later. To him who believes on his name, he is saved. With his mouth he confesses that Yeshua is Lord. Uh, and he is saved, period. It's that simple. Uh, it's by grace. It's not by works. If it was by works, then I'd have to work to get the gift so that I could prove that I'm saved. No, it doesn't work like that. Okay. And also 1 Corinthians 12, 30 says, do all have the gift of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. It's a rhetorical question that Paul is saying. So if everyone spoke in tongues, then we can say that everyone that's saved speaks in tongues. But Paul says, no, look, it's a gift. Okay. Myth number three, it's the Kundalini spirit. Have you heard that one out there? Recently, I watched a, a couple of teachings, one particular teacher that wanted to, to, to believe that this was the Kundalini spirit that was coming upon believers that were speaking in tongues. And he showed people that were in the Kundalini spirit that had the Kundalini spirit and then people that were speaking in tongues and showed some of the similarities. Well, the problem is, is that the similarities are hardly similar if you really understand the Kundalini spirit. If you've never heard of the Kundalini spirit, the Kundalini spirit is, is, is a spirit that comes from Hinduism, and it is a spirit that they believe that comes through typically through Hindu yoga, and it is a serpent that coils itself up around your, your spine, and it goes through all seven chakras in your body. And when it gets to the top, uh, you, then you enter in what they call enlightenment. All right. In that process, some of the description, uh, some of the characteristics of the Kundalini spirit is that, um, it's first of all, it's mostly transferred through the laying on of hands to the forehead. Do you find that interesting? The scriptures actually tell elders to to lay hands on people and to put their hands on their forehead. Even the ancient priest 
when they were inaugurated, would inaugurate the next priest by putting the hand on the forehead. The prophets would put the hand on the forehead. Why do you think Satan is having his minions uh, put the hand and transferring a spirit from the forehead, from the hand to a forehead? We don't understand it, but clearly there is a scientific, on a spiritual and a scientific level, there is a transfer of from one entity to another through that mode. So just because uh, the, in Hinduism they're transferring this demonic spirit from the hand to the forehead does not invalidate the scriptures or the laying on the hands of elders uh, to, to people that are in the congregation for healing and for salvation and for whatever does not invalidate that. Satan's counterfeit does not invalidate the reality, okay? One of the other characteristics, strong characteristics of the Kundalini spirit is of jerking. And you can look this up all over YouTube. They will have, uh, out of nowhere, when this spirit enters into this into a body, they have no control over the members of their body. They will fall on the ground. They will start flopping around like fish. Uh, their heads will start jerking around. Their hands will jerk. Their, their, every part of them jerks around as this demon is moving around inside of their body. You might have seen this in some of these so-called revivals uh, decades ago where people were falling down on the ground, drunk in the spirit, and they were, they were flopping around and jerking. There were people there that I believe were not true believers in Messiah that were receiving this spirit and it was manifesting itself in the church. And because the leaders of the churches of those time periods and those congregations were not grounded in the front of the book, were not grounded in, in the scriptures of exactly how this gift of tongues that is real is supposed to operate, it, the, the enemy took advantage of that lack of knowledge and he spread a unholy fire uh, through Christendom for quite some time. A lot of great things came out of some of those uh, revivals because God is bigger than the enemy and is always there to meet people that are sincere, that want to be healed and so on and so forth. But for the most part, there was a lot of demonic stuff that happened at the same time. And so again, we cannot discount reality because of a fake. Just because someone hands a teller at the bank a fake $10 bill does not invalidate the one that's real. Just because they look alike, feel alike. All right. Uh, lastly, the Kundalini spirit, one of its main functions or one of the things that it can't stand is prophecy. It tries to block and pollute the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is a known thing. So how can the gift of tongues be equated to the, to the, to, uh, to the Kundalini spirit if the person that is speaking tongues is a strong believer, they love the Lord, their life is changed, they have a burden for the lost, uh, they are uh, evangelizing, they're using the, the, the image of Christ is flowing through them, the gifts of the Spirit are strong, and we are to believe that they are operating in a demon simultaneously in operation in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, I don't think so, my friends. All right, myth number four, vain repetition. Uh, this one's brought up by, by many people that, that don't believe in the gift of tongues because they'll say, hey, look, the gift of tongues and the prayer language, I've heard it. It's gibberish. People have like 10 syllables and they just repeat it over and over and over again. I've even heard people that believe in the gift of tongues say that those that speak with repetitive uh, syllables and phrases, that's not the gift of tongues. On the contrary, I'm going to prove to you by the end of this teaching that that is simply not true. That's putting God in a box to say that it has to be one for one. That God can't say that, 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 that if I speak one word, He cannot miraculously translate that into the ears of a, of a foreigner into a hundred. If He can beat 10,000 people in an army with 300, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if one can put a thousand astray and 10 put 10,000, uh, I, I can assure you that God can take five words uh, that are intelligible and what we consider gibberish and cause an entire book to be opened up in the ears of the beholder. That is the God that I serve. My God is not confined to a one-for-one -one translation. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so vain repetition. And they get that from Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. It says this. We'll read it together. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. 
The intention of the heathen is that his God will hear him because of his repetitive chants and pleadings. This is what the prophets of Baal did with Elijah. So when Yeshua gave these instructions, say, don't pray like vain, you know, like the, like the heathens do with vain repetition, what's happened is, is that the, the Jewish uh, rabbis and Pharisees of that day in the Siddur books were praying over and over and over the same prayers as if God would just hear them because they prayed them a thousand times. This is where the Catholic Church got the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers from. In the same chapter, Yeshua said, look, pray this. He was not saying, pray this exact prayer eight million times every time you sin. No, he was saying, look, in this way you need to pray. In other words, you need to give honor to the Father. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to forgive those who trespass against you. He's setting the parameters of the categories of what's most important to pray for. It's also important that you understand that in this vain repetition, not only is, is it taken out of context to, to connect that to, uh, to, to tongues, uh, but you're killing other scriptures that say that we have no ability to know of what we're supposed to be praying. We cannot understand exactly what we're supposed to pray for. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that we cannot understand. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the word groanings in the Greek literally means tongues. It doesn't. But the point of that scripture is that we don't know what we're supposed to pray. We don't know fully the depth of everyone's situation. The Holy Spirit does. So when this gift of tongues comes upon those who have the gift and we pray, the Holy Spirit is interceding through us. It's praying for the things that we don't have a clue what to pray for. Okay, so vain repetition. It is a very sad exegetical attempt to to manipulate and twist the scriptures to say that just because people that are speaking in tongues in a repetitive way, oh, that is, uh, is, is, is the scripture of Matthew 6, verse 7, when the whole original intent of Matthew 6, 7 is to point out that if you have the intention of trying to get God's attention through repeating a certain prayer over and over and over again, you are in vain before God. If someone is speaking in tongues and they're repeating a, a particular, and their tongues is, is a, re a repetitive phrase, let's say, or, or a couple of sentences, their intention is not to try to get God to notice them because they're speaking in this, in this repetitive language. Their intent is to enter into the, 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 the atmosphere of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. They just want to please God. There's no ulterior motive. Remember, this verse in Matthew 6, 7 is about ulterior motive of the individual praying. Okay, that's why it can't be used uh, for tongues. Myth number five. If the Messiah wanted us to speak in tongues, he would have told us. I heard one uh, recent teacher make this point, and he said, he said, why didn't Messiah teach us this? Why not Peter or James or John or Jude or anyone else for that matter? Out of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, only six mention tongues, and three of them, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, was Paul regulating it. That's what that online Bible teacher said was, look, if the Messiah, if we're supposed to, to have this gift, why wouldn't the Messiah told us to do this? Why wouldn't Peter, James, uh, or John teach us this, or even Jude? And the answer is, uh, is, is self-evident. Jesus or Yeshua also did not teach on polygamy, what leadership in the congregation should look like, how ministers should make their living, never talked about the fivefold offices of ministry, how to deal with Gentiles that would come to faith, what the spiritual gifts were, etc. All those topics were expounded on by other authors in the New Testament. You see, we have to be very careful in how we interpret the scriptures and how we use exegesis uh, and, and, to, to, to and how we exegetically pull from the scriptures what's supposed to be there versus eisegesis reading into the scriptures something that's not or our current theology. In this case, what this, this Bible teacher did, which is a really good Bible teacher, but in this particular incident, he stretched the scriptures and created a dangerous precedent. That dangerous precedent is this. If Jesus didn't say it, it's not of God. If Yeshua doesn't mention it, then it's not from the Lord. If that's the case, then we need to throw out three quarters of the New Testament because three quarters of the New Testament is written about topics from authors of all different walks of life about things that Jesus never talked about. 
So we cannot create that precedence. As a matter of fact, when we're dealing with uh, th this particular topic of Jesus has to, has to tell us, well, look, uh, not only did, did Jesus not talk about any of those things, the, he never necessarily talked about homosexuality either. And homosexuality makes up only three verses in the entire New Testament. Yet, according to him, uh, this, the, the speaking of tongues is six chapters by Paul. So somehow we're to believe that because there's only six chapters in the Bible that talk about the gift of tongues, that somehow that invalidates it. I don't know about you, my friends, but if there's a single verse that talks about something and gives us instruction, we should pay attention to that. Making light of six full chapters on this subject and saying that, look, uh, if, if, we, if we're supposed to talk about it, Jesus would have mentioned it, um, is really bad. Uh, it's really bad exegesis. We can't do that. We can't do that at all. Myth number six, the, the Greek word for tongues, glossa, only means human language. I, I saw this all over the internet where teachers that were against the gift of tongues would point out that, look, everybody, the Greek word glossa literally means human language. So here's the argument. The author uses the Greek word uh, glossa to describe tongues and that the word is the word for human languages, which it is. Therefore, tongues must only be a human language. This is the straw man argument that they bring up. It says right here in the Greek that glossa means human language. Therefore, the word tongues that Paul is using must be talking about human languages only. My friends, they forget there is no other word for a spiritual heavenly language in the Greek language. It doesn't exist at that time. This is a gift from heaven. In, in, in the Greek language, there is no other word. So Paul is using the only word that he has at his disposal to describe this, which is glossa. It is a language. It absolutely is a, is a language. And the only reason why Strong's has it as a human language is because that's what the Greek word meant before the heavenly language came along. And so it's important for you to understand that in the secular society of Greek, of course, there is no spiritual word. This is a spiritual concept. And so uh, ironically, Paul actually uses the same Greek, Greek word glossa in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, when he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. My friends, if glossa only means human languages, why does he use it? in the context of angelic languages. Isn't that a direct contradiction in itself? Absolutely. We don't want to let uh, a, a principle of interpretation contradict itself. Incredibly, it contradicts itself not only uh, with this subject in the same chapter that the very word that they're saying is only human language in the very first verse. It's used uh, in a different context, in a different way to prove that this word can mean other languages as well. All right, number seven, myth number seven, the gift of tongues as a prayer language is not mentioned in church history until just a couple hundred years ago. This is an interesting argument. I looked deep into this. There are literally dozens of examples of tongues uh, being used uh, throughout church history, even in uh, Roman uh, Catholic Roman, a uh, Roman Catholic church history. The church fathers, uh, talk about uh, the gift of tongues. And yes, they do talk about it as a, a foreign language, that someone heard them in a foreign language. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But what the but most, most teachers that are against this will point out that there's nothing that references this prayer language that's being talked about today. Now, let's think about the logic about this, that we're creating a hermeneutical principle that says that if a group of people over enough time do not mention something that's found in the Bible, therefore it doesn't exist. So let's, let's just dive into this. If our understanding of biblical doctrine, and especially our understanding of prophecy and spirit-filled matters, rest solely on the anti-Semitic Roman church fathers, then we are in big trouble. The fact that there are no recorded documents of miracles and healings with the entire 175-year history of the Southern Baptist Church does not invalidate the fact that miracles and healings exist. 
But see, using the philosophy that some people do, that just because they can't find any writings over the last uh, 1500 year span that talk about the gift of tongues in a prayer language, their deduction is it must not be true. Well, what if, what if it was it, the, the entire church history was Southern Baptist and there was never uh, a writing about or, or a testimony of someone being healed? Would we then use the same principle and say, well, there can't be a gift of healings because there's nothing in church history that says anybody was healed. If you know anything about church history and all of the hellacious damage to the scriptures that happened during that time period and how the Roman mother church had drastically uh, uh, bottlenecked and choked out the, the people from wanting to even learn the scriptures uh, so that they could have full control over the meaning, then it would make perfect sense while the things of the spirit would not be prevalent. So no one is in church history is going to write about the gift of tongues as a prayer language and hardly write about the gift period if the Holy Spirit is not prevalently moving among them to begin with. Does that make sense? If they're stuck in religion, if they're stuck in, in church dogma, and they're doing things that are unholy and unbiblical, they discount the front of the book, and Satan has his claws deep inside the leadership for well over 1,500 years, what do you expect? Do we expect tons of writings of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> no. That's why we don't see very much writing of it at all, because the testimonies are not until you get to some of the great awakenings that happen in the 18th and 19th and the 20th century, when God's people begin to uh, see the depth of His Word. They begin to repent of their sins. They begin to look at the Scriptures differently, and faith starts to come into them. They believe in God. They want to see miracles and healings. And so that faith is inaugurated and joined in the host of heaven, and miracles begin to happen. That's why we're beginning to see these testimonies show up now in the last few hundred years is because it's only been in the last few hundred years that this massive freedom of God's people to read the scriptures in their own language and to exercise that faith therein. Myth number eight, Paul was using hyperbole in 1 Corinthians 13.1. 1 Corinthians 13.1, let's read it together. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. So the argument goes that Paul is not speaking uh, in the tongues of angels. He's not saying that he speaks in the tongues of angels. He's being metaphorical. He's using hyperbole or intentional exaggeration to make a point. Now, here's where I'm going to, to throw a bone. I will absolutely agree. He is making a hyperbole here. He is giving a bit of an exaggeration. How do we know that? Because he says, if I have all faith, well, we know he doesn't have all faith. We know he doesn't know all the mysteries of heaven and can move mountains with a single thought. Nobody has that kind of faith. So Paul, we know, is using hyperbole. But let me just throw this out to those of you that are detractors to this topic. Why would Paul use that language at all? In the middle of his discourse about tongues. Do you notice that? Do you find that interesting? This isn't out of Book of Romans. This isn't Ephesians, right? This is right out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right in the middle of, of chapter 12 and 14 that talk about the gift of tongues. By the mere fact that he is literally saying, whether I speak with the tongues of men or the tongues of angels in the context of using the word tongues a half a dozen times in the previous chapter and a half a dozen times more in the, in the chapter after, in chapter 14, is suspicious. And so I'll leave it there that you can't prove it either way, but I think it's very suspicious that he's talking about a, a language that nobody can understand. We'll get to that in part two. In chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, he says, look, Nobody knows. No man knows the, the, the interpretation of this tongues. In another scripture, he says that they do, and they needs an interpreter, so there seems to be a contradiction. You have to wait to part two for us to unravel that apparent contradiction. But for now, I think it's important to say that Paul, I believe, knows exactly what he's doing, and he's bringing up 
the gift of tongues, and he's calling it the tongues of angels. Can't prove it, but contextually, it's, it's weighted heavier on the side that it is than it's not, simply because it's surrounding uh, that context. Myth number nine, it's the same as the New Age light language. I saw this again on a video of someone that strongly disagreed with the gift of tongues, and they tried to make the connection that the New Age movement has the same gift of tongues. They call it the light language. It's almost identical. Showed people speaking in tongues in Christianity. Showed people speaking in tongues in the New Age movement. Showed the similarities. No question, there are similarities. If you have the Spirit of God and you have any kind of discernment, you can pick it out a hundred times out of a hundred. You can say, that person's got the gift of tongues. That person is speaking the light language. You can see the difference right off the bat. I did immediately, and I think most people would, even with a light gift of discernment, you can tell. But let's talk about this difference, because I think this is a legitimate point that the gentleman was making. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. My friends, Satan can only imitate the things of God. He creates counterfeits. We cannot create a hermeneutical principle... Uh, hermeneutical is just a, hermeneutics is a fancy word that, that is, is the laws of interpreting the Bible. We cr cannot create a law of interpreting the Bible that says this can't be real because the New Age movement uses it. We can't do this because Satan does that. When Satan used to live with God in heaven and he has an angelic language. All of the angels have an angelic language, but some of them are fallen angels. So should it surprise you that the light language of the New Age cultic movement that literally say that they're tapping into the languages of angels, I believe it. I believe they are tapping into the angels language because Satan is a fallen angel. And I believe that the angelic language, the tongues of angels, that God's people are gifted by the Holy Spirit to speak, is that of the good side. So you, it's like Star Wars, right? You have the, the dark side and you have uh, the Republic. You have the good side. And in God's kingdom, you have his language and you have the enemy that perverts his language. So we cannot just say, okay, look at the comparison because this is evil. This must be good. A wise man who understands the tactics of the enemy that Satan comes as, as, a, as an imitator and an angel of light, okay, we cannot say, okay, there is no angels of light because Satan comes as an angel of light and he's bad, so therefore, you angel, Gabriel, get away from me because you have light coming from you. No, we can't do that. That's a bad hermeneutical principle. What we rather do is look at the fruit of what is coming out of these people. Do they declare Yeshua Jesus as the Messiah, Son of God, manifested on earth, died, rose again for our sins to give us a Holy Spirit to be guided into all truth? What truth? The truth of the Word of God. If they don't declare those things, then that tells us what spirit is in operation there. Because the Bible says that no man can declare that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay? The language of Yahweh, shall it be invalidated because the fallen angels speak the same language? May it never be. May it never be, my friends. Myth number 10, last but not least, Acts chapter 2 proves they were speaking foreign languages. There are some people that, that believe in the gift of tongues, but they believe that it is they were speaking foreign languages. They believe that the gift itself is the fact that I don't know any other foreign language but English, and if all of a sudden I start speaking Spanish, that's the gift of tongues. I'm going to challenge that, and I believe I'm going to pr present to you more evidence than not that will say that it's not a foreign language that the person is speaking. It's a foreign language that the person is hearing. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it says this, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. The text does not say that the disciples, or this group of 120, were praying uh, or speaking in other languages. It said that the people 
heard them in other languages. So right now, before we go any further, it's tied 50-50. You cannot prove that it was a miracle of speaking, and I can't prove that it was a miracle of hearing. But I believe that there's hints within the scripture that tell us that, 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 that weight the scale more towards it was a miracle of hearing. And I'll show you exactly why. First of all, it says in verse 6, and when the sound occurred, that word sound in the Greek literally means a tone, an utterance. It doesn't say language. It doesn't say words. It says when the sound, they were making sounds. And I believe even though it's a small evidence, I believe that it is in fact, doesn't go on the side of the language. It goes on the side of the miracle that they were, of uh, the hearing that they were speaking sounds. I'm going to suppose to you that they had no clue what they were saying. As a matter of fact, uh, the hint number one is sound, like I said, which is phone in Greek, which means tone or sound. The writer could have used any of the other words in Greek for language, but he didn't. He specifically used the word sound. Hint number two, much stronger. It says the text says they heard them in their own language. And hint number three, Acts 2 verse 13 says that others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now look, this is, I believe, the strongest evidence and hint that this was a miracle of the hearing because there were people from all walks of life that heard the disciples speaking in their own language, okay? They heard them speaking in their own language, but there were other people that thought they were drunk. And remember, it's only uh, nine o'clock in the morning, okay? And so uh, when, 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 the, uh, when the rooster crows, if you will, and all these people are speaking these crazy words, there are a certain group of people that thought they were drunk. Now, let me ask you a question. You live in the 21st century right now. Even if you don't speak any other language, if, I, if you heard someone speaking French, wouldn't you recognize it? If you heard them speaking Spanish or Australian accent, right? Or uh, even Hindu or Japanese or Chinese, you may not be able to totally tell the difference between Japanese and Chinese or Mandarin, but you know it's a language that exists today because you live in this culture and you've heard so many different languages in dialects even of languages. So we are to believe that there are people that are listening to the disciples speak in supposedly other languages and they don't recognize it as another language, but they live in that culture, they live in the context and they think that they're drunk. My friends, if you were listening to somebody on a street corner all of a sudden start speaking in another language, would you think they're drunk? Or would you simply think they know another language? Oh, they know Chinese. They know French. They're preaching in, uh, I think that's uh, this language or that language. You would never say that they're drunk. But if they start speaking in, a, in some sort of weird language that sounds like gibberish to you, you would probably say this guy's crazy, he's out of his mind, or he's drunk. And I believe that's exactly what happened. And I'm going to absolutely, I believe, nail this to the ground and prove it through testimony here in just a a moment. I believe this was not a miracle of speech. This was a miracle of hearing. I don't necessarily believe that there's two different types of tongues, if you will. What if it's all one? What if it's the gift of tongues is a repetitive language that's different for every person, and it's the person on the other end that might be hearing it in a different language? Let's find out. Let's go through some modern day miracles of hearing to show you that this is in operation today. I'm going to start with my own testimony, my daughter, Sierra. We were in a prayer meeting uh, last year, and I was so overcome by the Holy Spirit. I prayed as hard as I could in English, and it just would not come out anymore. And so I went right into my prayer language. I went right into the gift of tongues. I started speaking in tongues, and it was intense, and it was powerful. And my daughter, when I finished, had the largest smile on her face. And she said, Dad, I heard the interpretation. And she began to explain to me it was the most unbelievable experience that she's ever experienced on this topic. That as I was speaking, she heard me speak in tongues low, like the decibel level, the loudness was very low. But she heard me in English over the top of it. God was telling her word for word what I was saying in English. I had no idea what I was saying, 
but God was doing it. And she said the coolest part was, she said, Dad, every time you stopped for a second, God would stop. I would stop hearing you in English, and it was synced up perfectly. Even though you were being repetitive, the word just kept coming and kept coming. And she said, the moment that you finished, there's no way that I could have known that you were going to finish because you paused several times. So I wouldn't know if you were going to finish that particular time. But the moment you finished, the entire word was finished. In other words, it was complete in its entirety, as if the end of a story was an exclamation point on the moment that I stopped, it stopped. That's how powerful it was. Now, I'm speaking in a repetitive tongue language, but my daughter is hearing, God is interpreting in English. So it was a miracle of hearing because I I did not speak uh, in any other language. Uh, This gentleman, Brad, online says this, I put out a post on Facebook for anybody that speaks in tongues to tell me their testimony. So these are people that are in, 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 uh, these are your peers that are out there that believe in the front of the book, the back of the book. They're all in, full Bible believers, and they speak in tongues. This is their testimony. Let me just go through a few of these. Brad says this, I personally never had a time when someone knew what I was saying in another language, but I was with a friend once at a conference And as my friend was praying aloud in tongues, regular gibberish tongues, an Israeli man in front of us turned around and asked if we were Israeli. We said no. He said that my friend spoke Hebrew so perfectly. He told us that my friend was proclaiming the greatness of God in Hebrew. Perfect example right there that the tongues was a miracle of hearing. Uh, Didi says this, I have two occasions while on separate mission trips where someone came up to me and told me they understood what I was saying. I asked them what they heard, and both times they said I was praising God. I personally have listened to someone from another country speaking in tongues. I think it was Finland, who did not know English, and I heard them speaking in English. And I heard them saying that God is great and holy is his name. Do you see the pattern here? Is that what's being said is God is, is it, they're praising God in their tongues. They have no idea what they're doing. The spirit is interceding for them, but the other person is hearing it in a completely different language. This totally debunks the idea that there's no such thing as a prayer language. Because if there was no such thing as a prayer language and the gibberish and repetitive phrases are of the devil, it's a kundalini spirit and it's not of God, then what is the kundalini spirit interpreting itself, praising God in the Hebrew tongue? Ladies and gentlemen, we need to to, to, to get right about this because God is doing some amazing things in the earth and he wants us to believe in what he's doing. Let's keep going. Cecilia says this, once in an English speaking church service, someone was speaking in tongues and I understood the message in my native language. I believe she's a Hispanic. The message was from my pastor and I passed it on to him. God gave this message for this individual who's speaking English tongues, okay, in an English-speaking church, speaking tongues, this person heard it in Spanish and told their pastor. How amazing is that? Jennifer says this, I don't know when things first started, but I remember when I first heard tongues. I heard them in whatever language they were speaking and in English simultaneously. This is exactly what my daughter Sierra said, a simultaneous interpretation. I attended a worship service and someone spoke in tongues. I was brand new Christian. I completely understood every word they spoke. I was astounded. I turned to the woman next to me in shock. And I said, telling her that I understood what the speaker was saying. She nodded and smiled and carried on with worship. From her response, I assumed that everyone spoke in tongues and understood what people were saying in tongues. She went for years, if I remember her post right, thinking that everybody understood people that were speaking in tongues. She had been given the gift of interpretation. These people were speaking in what we would consider gibberish, or what some people would consider gibberish. But it wasn't gibberish to her. She heard it in English and was astounded at all the amazing things that God was saying through her. Gregory says this, I was sharing the gospel with a man from Brazil and was reading John chapter 3 when he interrupted me and asked me if I knew Portuguese. He was speaking... Uh, uh, in, in this person heard him speak in Portuguese. That's amazing. 
Uh, Eileen says this, one evening before service, there was a few people praying in tongues before the service started. And I remember after we had finished, a woman came up to me and said she understood what I had said because it was in her language. Again, on and on it goes. I'm just going to give you a couple more because these, and there were hundreds. Uh, I'm just picking out, you know, six, seven, eight of them. Hank says, on a mission trip to Panama, as we were returning from a restaurant in downtown Panama City, oh, this one's really good, where the pastor's son told us that they were believing to receive an abandoned bank building to minister to the drug addicts and the prostitutes in the area, I decided I was going to pray, but not silently as we were walking by it. He asked, what did you say? So he's praying in tongues just silently, kind of a little bit uh, you know, out loud so he can hear them, uh, but he's just praying kind of to himself. And he says, and his friend says, what did you say? I said, nothing. I was just praying. He said, do you speak Spanish? I replied, no. He asked, you don't speak Spanish. I again said, no. But you said, lo tendromos. Okay. The person said, okay. You don't know what lo tendremos means? No, I don't speak Spanish. He said, lo tendremos means we will have it. So this person, they're praying and believing that God is going to give them this bank for ministry purposes. And he starts praying on their way there. And, and he's praying. He starts praying in tongues. And his friend who speaks Spanish says, wait a minute, do you speak Spanish? No, I don't speak Spanish. He says, man, you just said we will have it in Spanish. That's what you're saying over and over again. We will have it. So at the end of the day, my friends, no one is going to tell these people that tongues isn't real, that interpretation isn't real, that God himself is not real today from the same gift that he gave his church 2,000 years ago. And I believe this is the last one. Sinai says this. He says, in me, it happened a little differently than everyone else. I first began to understand what other people spoke in tongues, and I began to long to speak them. And it was a really difficult moment for me because how much I wanted and I suffered wanting to pray to the Father uh, for tongues in my room. The Spirit came on me and I began to finally speak in tongues. Since then, the Father has used that gift to give messages to me for other people. So God would speak through him the gift of tongues and then give him the interpretation for other people. And that happens as well. My friends, I find it interesting that in over two decades of ministry service, the same people that are very critical of the gift of tongues seem to also be the same ones who don't see many miracles, healings, and most rarely hear the voice of God, if ever, in their life. While those that believe in the gift tend to be the ones giving testimonies of people getting healed, saved, delivered from demons, and walking in the power of God. This doesn't mean that you have to have the gift of tongues in order to be part of those things, or that people that have this gift are any better than anyone else. They're most certainly not. We're all the same at the cross. It's just an interesting statistic that those who do believe in it, whether they have it or not, tend to be the very ones that have prophetic visions, dreams, and experience the supernatural more. I even had a friend of mine tell me recently that he preached in a church once and asked everyone who spoke in tongues to raise their hands. Then he asked those who had ever laid hands on someone and they were healed or had cast a demon out of someone to raise their hands. Shockingly, 99% of the congregation that raised their hands were the same ones who believed in the gift of tongues. In the end, I believe a large part of why the statistic is so true is because those that don't believe tend to operate strongly in only what they can see and understand with their own minds. They struggle with the unseen and therefore struggle in having faith. This is why a Southern Baptist that doesn't believe in healings will likely never see one or be a part of one. His lack of belief and faith forces him to never be a part of a healing or a miracle, which then perpetuates his own theology in that area. And this is why it is so important to take time to go through this topic in this kind of detail. In the meantime, if this video blessed you, would you please do us a favor and hit the like button right now and leave us a comment. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. When you do that, the algorithms pick that up and recommend this video to others, thus allowing us to reach more people. Feel free in the meantime to visit our website at passionfortruth.com or follow me on Facebook at or Instagram at Jim Staley Official. Someone has donated to this ministry so that you could be blessed today. Would you consider paying it forward for others? If so, text 
pay it forward, all one word, to 801-801. That's pay it forward, no spaces, to 801-801. Or go to passionfortruth.com.